W-O-N. The views expressed on our programs are not necessarily those of WVON, Midway Broadcasting Corporation, or our participating sponsors. From the Xfinity Studios at WVON, we are the talk of Chicago. 1690 WVON. All right, brothers and sisters, this last hour is going to be power pack right here on WVON. You're listening to Straight Words of Brother Nabar Richard Muhammad, Brother James D. Muhammad. I'm Brother B.J. Murphy. Coming up, we're going to discuss what's uh, going on in Haiti. Our special guest, Robert Roth, is holding on the line from the Haiti Action Committee. But before we go to him, we got some brothers that's been holding on, our faithful listeners. We got uh, Brother Cliff and Brother Ronald. Let's go to Brother Cliff first, then we'll go to you, Brother Ronald. Welcome to WVON tonight. Go ahead and talk to us, black man. Hey, assalamu alaikum, brothers. I won't take too much time. Uh-huh. I know you got to guess another callers, so I'll get right to the point. In reference to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, Savior's Day, you know, you'll have blacks that will go to the National Democratic Convention, and whatever performance they'll use, you even have a few black people say to Biden, I love you, you'll have the same thing going with Trump, and at the Republican Convention, some Negroes saying, I love you, but deep down in my heart, the love that black people should have will be for the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And the truth that he spoke on Savior's Day, this brother is truly divine, and he spoke truth. And as you say, as it relates to our enemies, not as they sent out disinformation, but straight out lie. And when he talked about with Israel and the genocide that the Israeli people or the government is pursuing to the Palestinian people and brothers. Why did he say basically that was ha- that was happening? If you can recall, but he basically said the reason why that territory is so valuable is for the billions of dollars of right. natural gas and oil reserves. And brother, didn't I mention that to you a couple of months ago? And that's sure, exactly sure what did, confirmed. Brother. And so, yeah. without a doubt. <laughs> That's where the truth is coming from. And that's why I love the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, because he's giving guidance. He's giving revelation of the truth that's happening throughout the world. And he, in, in closing, he said that the same <clears throat> genocide that's planned for the Palestinian people is the same genocide that's planned for black people in this country. We better listen to our savior the minister, Louis Farrakhan. <coughs> Thank, you, brothers. <coughs> Thank you, Cliff. And we got your donation again this week, man. Appreciate you. Yes, sir. We got Brother Ronald. Brother Ronald, assalamu alaikum. Go ahead and talk to us on WBON tonight. Wa, wa alaikum salam. I, I, I just wanted to, to, to follow up. Uh, Cliff, Cliff. Cliff led the way, and I was was headed in that same same direction because the last thing he reminded us of uh, uh, at the same day address was the interest that the so called Jews have in the destruction of our black youth and. This is what's going on, and and, and and he showed us how that government controls this government. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, if they, you, they, they, they offer you to vote, but you have no one to vote for. They, they, whoever you're voting for is on the same agenda. So right. our, our salvation is within again the unity with himself and 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 i i just wanted 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 to 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 highlight that because that that was the last thing the minister spoke on was and and so you asked the question why 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 are they interested in our youth okay Mm. why yeah right because these are fair kinds children, brother. Mm. Our problem is the divine problem, right? And and then he said that 
they are going after them because these children they cannot control. That's right. And we have there. to round them up. And he said, bring them to him. So that's what we got to do. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Real quick, thank you, Brother Ronald. Ronald. And Brother yeah, Ronald is another. Either. Go ahead. Uh, no, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, finish that, brother. No, I'm just going to say Brother Ronald is another big supporter, man. Yes, sir. Oh, Absolutely. Man. Yes, sir. Before we get to Mr. Rock, let's go to um, Anita. Anita, you were on Straight Words on WBON. Oh. Peace, sister. How you doing? I'm doing just fine. I'm glad you all are facing the truth. And there's nothing for us to be upset about. Uh, because we already made the world where the whole world is coming here to get their freedom. And they have no respect for the sacrifices that was made. So I guess they'll end up living tortured by some, some slave master, whoever that would be, because we don't need them to be our slaves. Um, there's nothing we can do. The, the whole world is lost, and, and they hide behind fake religion. And, um, you know, and they're using things that's not from God and saying it's from God, because God said, like Elijah Muhammad, he, the first thing he told Abraham was, don't sacrifice your son. And Elijah Muhammad taught us, hey, men, you know, do what you got to do to make sure this stuff is, has the right leadership. And there's no other men on the earth that everybody's running to to be to they, be in their country for freedom but this one. So who That's did right. it right, the black men? You don't need to be castrated and hung and kidnapped and beat and raped and taught, you know, pedophilia and all that or whatever. I don't know what the right word is for that, but uh, little boys and girls being raped, you know, by grown men, you know, um, this this is disgusting. Why why are we even listening to people that absolutely have no direction? White people have no direction. Their men are not men. You cannot beat other men and force them in jail and shoot them down on the street because they won't take care of you. Hmm. I don't know what sense yes, that makes to you. That's why right. would another be the, a, a woman, like I told Alan Sharp, that a woman can't even force a man to take care of her. I don't care how many children she has. So why should a, a man have the right to force you to take care of him? You, mm -hmm. We don't need to support the white world. They are not our children. They are adults. We can't tell them what to do. So, you know, we take care of things. They're small, they're little, and they're developing and growing and being taught. An old person is what he is. I mean, there's nothing you can do with that. That person has to go to God and change his heart. And there's nothing we can do with them but to speak the truth and move them out the way. That's All right. Thank you very much, Anita. Appreciate you. We're going to go yes. on to uh, Robert Roth, who is a veteran anti-imperialist activist and educator. Uh, he has worked for decades against U.S. intervention around the world and on campaigns to free political prisoners here in the U.S. Um, Mr. Ross is a co-founder of the Haitian Action Committee and a board member of the Haitian Emergency Relief Fund. Mr. Roth, are you there? I am. Yes, I am. And, and please call me Robert. Okay, Robert, you can call me uh, Brother Muhammad or Brother Nava. Okay. We'll get that out the way, okay? All right. Thank you for, thank you for coming on. I mean, you know, um, wow. I don't even know where to start. Let me, let me. You know, Haiti is one of my locks. Um, We heard recently um, about, uh, quote-unquote, gangs um, mm -hmm. raiding a prison in Haiti and letting some people out and gangs, quote-unquote, controlling the country. Robert, can you talk, when we think of gangs, we think of a certain context. Mm -hmm. can, you, can, can you talk about when, when, when there's this talk of gangs in Haiti, what exactly are we talking about? Are we talking about criminal enterprises alone, or are we talking about something a little more sophisticated 
and a little more entrenched in the po- in the politics of the country itself. <clears throat> um, we're definitely talking about something more sophisticated and deeply entrenched in the politics of the country. And like that's why in Haiti Action Committee, we try not to just call these these groups gangs. We call them paramilitary, death mm-hmm. squad, mm-hmm. death squad, right? And, <clears throat> and that's because we see their connection to government officials and to this small elite, this oligarchy that has controlled Haiti forever, you know, economically. And what they've done is that they've developed these paramilitary forces to do their bidding, to wipe out opposition neighborhoods, to commit one massacre after another, where where um, grassroots activism challenges their rule to, like, for example, um, paramilitaries at the port in Haiti give the various oligarchs the ability to avoid customs taxes, and they can also, and gives them the ability to bring in guns and drugs into the country. So without the support of government officials and without the support of different sectors of the elite, these gangs would have, they wouldn't have sophisticated weapons, which they do have. They wouldn't have free reign to do their bidding all across the country. They're doing this with a government that has allowed it to happen and that has used them, has weaponized them in order to maintain its control over Haiti. And and the support like that the government has gotten has come straight from here, from the United States. The same country that's arming Israel, the same country that has intervened everywhere, the same country that was a slave-owning power forever, is now creating, has created this situation, and then throws up its its hand and says, wow, look at Haiti. Haiti is so chaotic. Haiti is overrun by gangs. Haiti is a failed state. Haiti, Haiti is corrupt. And what that is, those are like the code words for anti-blackness, number one. They're the code words of white supremacy. And, they're, and they hide the reality that the situation in Haiti begins right here in the U.S. empire with the dirty deeds that the U.S. has been doing towards Haiti for the entire existence of the Haitian Republic. You know, I, I want to get to, and I, and I want to make sure we don't um, miss talking about Haiti, a call to action, an, an event that's scheduled for, for April 6th. But mm-hmm. I, I, I think it's important, though, to get, so that people get a better understanding. Because if you look at mainstream media, if you look at uh, what the, the government, U.S. government says, it's Haiti's a basket case. Haiti mm-hmm. can never rule itself. Haiti is the problem over and over again. What, you know, we, we, we know, of course, historically, when Haiti kicked the French out mm-hmm. and became the first black republic, it was America that blockaded Haiti. Mm-hmm. We know from around 1915 to around 1934, America literally occupied Haiti. We know that, I guess, in the 90s, to bring it all the way up, with the election of John Bertrand Aristide, it was the Americans that came and took him out of the country. This was the popularly elected um, Haitian priest who had support among the masses. But it was America that came and took him out of the country, took him to South Africa, finally allowed him to come back, but did not allow him to to complete his term. 
what are some of the other things that we need to know in terms of how America has intervened in Haiti and why has there been such constant intervention? Well, you just laid out some of the key facts about that about that history, but let me add some more. Um, like, as you say, like Haiti's always been in the crosshairs of the world's imperialist powers. Like the Haitian Revolution, like you re- referred to it, ushered in the world's first black republic at a time when slavery was in full force. And the example of Haiti where enslaved people had broken their chains and won total victory against the French. And this was against Napoleon's army, the most powerful army at that time in the world. And they won total victory in 1804. And that example was terrifying to slaveholding powers everywhere. And immediately, as you said, the U.S. put an embargo around Haiti. The United States didn't even recognize Haiti, the Haiti Republic, until the 1860s during the middle of the Civil War. And until that point, it had encircled, blockaded Haiti, and denied it any diplomatic, revolu- um, any diplomatic recogni- recognition. In 1725, which is just, I mean, in 1825, which is just like 20 years, basically, after the Haitian Revolution succeeded, French warships, a whole flotilla of French warships encircled Haiti and the port of Port-au-Prince and demanded reparations from Haiti as the price for Haitian independence. And this is the only time in history where the formerly enslaved had to pay reparations to their former slave owners. Of course, it should have been the other way around. And over the course of the next 120 plus years, Haitians would have to pay the equivalent of $21.7 billion. And some, um, some researchers now say that the figure is closer to $50 billion to both French and then U.S. banks. And with the first payment that Haiti made to service this debt, it had to close its public schools. And this debt continued in the 40s. And one of the main reasons for that invasion that you talked about in 1915 to 1934, which, by the way, the president at the time of that invasion was Woodrow Wilson, who was a notorious racist towards, towards Black people here in the U.S. But that invasion was designed to, in, to take to take control of all of Haiti's resources and including to make sure that that debt continued to be paid. And so like when when people talk about Haiti as, quote, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, or like, as you said, a basket case, we, we say that Haiti is actually a country rich in resources, incredible mineral resources, rich in creativity and people power, but it's been one that's been made poor by foreign domination and white supremacy. And so when, when you look at the, in the 1990s, and then again, in, in the early 2000s, when John Bertrand Aristide was elected overwhelmingly twice, the United States overthrew that government, which was the most progressive government in Haiti's history. It overthrew the government both in 1991, after only about seven months in power, and it overthrew it again in 2004 and kidnapped President Aristide and his wife and colleague, Mildred Aristide, and sent them to the Central African Republic. Eventually, they ended up in South Africa, where the South African government took them in. And when they wanted to return, to Haiti, like around 2011, the Obama administration told the South Africans, we do not want you to do that. There will be heavy consequences if you allow the Aristides to get on a plane and come back to Haiti. 
in spite of that, they did. And they were greeted by thousands and thousands of people who remembered the game that had happened during the Aristide years, who remembered that more schools had been built than at any other time in Haitian history, who remembered the rural health clinics that were built for the first time, who remembered that in the poorest areas of Haiti, in the poorest communities, in the Port-au-Prince areas and in rural areas, that had never seen a doctor, that mobile health clinics were going out and, you know, meeting with communities to provide the first health care that they had ever had. When I was in, I've been in Haiti six times. And on one of my trips, I saw, I went to the city, to the community of Cité Soleil, which is, you know, talked about in the U.S. as, quote unquote, this slum. And really, it's this, like, massive massive shanty town. And in that community, the Lavalas government, Lavalas is the party of President Aristide, had built had, you know, had built public parks for the first time, lighted public parks where people could read, you know, by light during the night. And, you know, Aristide was the first president that gave his inaugural address in Creole rather than in the colonial French language. So all of these things resonated so deeply with people in Haiti, and yet that government was overthrown in a disastrous coup. And that was in 2004. That the crisis in Haiti today, with these paramilitaries running all over the place, with over 5,000 people have been killed this year alone, 300,000 Haitians have been internally displaced by all of this warfare, that, that, that these, these conditions are the direct result of the U.S. orchestrated coup in 2004 and the imposition of one illegitimate dictatorship after another. And that's what's at the source of the current crisis in Haiti. Mm. You know, it, it, I've, I've been to Haiti about five times. Um, and uh, I think it's a beautiful country of uh, beautiful people. It's, it's really one of my loves. Mm-hmm. When, you, when, when we look at Haiti and we look at now U.S. policy and, and, and domination, now we hear talk of um, Kenyan troops coming into Haiti. And I believe right. the Kenyans speak English. They don't even speak French. Um, mm-hmm. And I believe that Haiti's president recently... Um, went to Kenya to sign some kind of agreement that would allow about a thousand police officers to come into Haiti. I I, I find it one. I'm trying to figure out what are one thousand police officers, quote unquote, going to do in mm-hmm. a country where they don't even speak the language, right? And I don't know if the Kenyan police generally have a good reputation for for respecting human rights. What do you see happening? In that equation. Okay, well, first of all, the Kenyan police have a terrible reputation mm-hmm. around human And in this year alone, they, there have been mass demonstrations in Kenya against the current government. And like the current government signed a deal with the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, where they removed subsidies on fuel. And, you know, as part of what called structural adjustment, the neoliberal economic plan that the U.S. and all of these financial institutions have pushed all over the world. And because of that, the price of fuel, the price of gas, the price of food soared in Kenya. And there were massive demonstrations by hundreds of thousands of Kenyans. And the police, the same police that are now being you know, primed to invade Haiti, shot down, dem- shot down nonviolent demonstrators in the street, killing a hundred, a little bit more than a hundred protesters. They are notoriously corrupt, notoriously brutal, known for <clears throat> people in detention. And this is, this is the country that is now going to export that to Haiti. Now, why? Mm. Because the United, and, and it's the U.S. that's organized it. The U.S. for a year 
has been trying to find a country that will front what's really a U.S., Canadian, and French organized invasion. You know, Haiti's already occupied. It was occupied by and like thousands of troops from different countries, like organized by the U.N., and remnants of that are still there in Haiti. And there's a group called the Core Group, which is the U.S., France, Canada, Germany, the European Union, Brazil, like a number of countries that really exercise full political power over Haiti. So why do they need Kenyans right now? And what they want is they want to bolster, they want to bolster the repressive government that is now in power in Haiti. They want to crush all opposition and they want to do it with black troops. They want to do it Mm. with a black face on what really is a white supremacist invasion. So they're looking Mm. at Kenya. They're looking at 2000 troops recently. We heard this news from Benin, which is French speaking. And they're and they're going all throughout the Caribbean to try to get CARICOM countries, including Barbados, Mm. to also join this invasion. So what they want Mm. is they want the appearance of a multinational African Caribbean force that they can call peacekeeping. But really, this will be under its finance and controlled and organized by the U.S. and the U.N., and it's going to be used to attempt to crush this very, very vibrant popular movement that still is, is, is in existence in Haiti 20 years after the coup against President Aaron. Uh, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. can I ask a couple questions, Nava? Yeah, go um, ahead, go ahead, Brother James. Yes, yeah. yeah, sir. What, what's your assessment of the, uh, the assassination of the previous president, and how is that playing into the goal of the imperialists um, who are, you know, planning outcomes for Haiti? And then secondly, uh, with the uh, the paramilitary so-called gangs, as you mentioned, <laughs> Uh, are they on the same agenda or will these factions be at odds with each other once, you know, some some semblance of control is gained by either one of those paramilitary uh, forces with the leaders that they have? So those okay. two questions that you can address. Right. Well, let me, I'm going to like start. What was the first part of the question? Yeah. The, the first part of your question. No, I was asking were, about, uh, well, number one, well, was the second one was, was the, the assassination. The, yeah, the assassination yeah. of the previous president. The former president. Okay. Yeah. And right. how that plays into everything that's happening now. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, here's the mainstream narrative. The mainstream narrative says the assassination of Jovenel Moise, like, brought the chaos to Haiti. And in reality, Jovenel Moise, who was a a member of the PHTK party in Haiti, which is really a right-wing, ultra-right-wing party, he had been elected, and we call it selected, in a totally fraudulent series of elections. There were massive demonstrations against him throughout his term. He sold He was in the process of selling off all the country's resources and one and and his party was involved in a number of massacres in opposition communities, including in the um, in the community of La Saline. And we had people from Haiti Action Committee and the National Lawyers Guild do an investigation of that massacre in which well over 100 people were killed. Hundreds of others were injured, homes were burned, and women and children were raped. And this happened under Jovenel Moise. Now, we look at what at the assassination as a falling out among thieves, right? This was not from the grassroots movement. Jovenel Moise had served his purpose, and in many ways, his time was over. Like, he was was a a lightning rod 
for opposition. And sectors of the ruling elite were done with him. They assassinated him. And in his place, they put Ariel Henry, the current dictator of Haiti. And Ariel Henry was, there was a contest right after Moise got assassinated. And there was a, a, a competition between Ariel Henry and another elite politician. And the way it got resolved is that that core group that I was talking about of all these foreign countries issued a tweet that said Ariel Henry should be the next prime minister of Haiti. There was no election. There has been no election since. And there, in fact, are no elected officials in Haiti. No functioning parliament, no mayors, no local officials. Officials, this is a government that is ruling by decree. And how does it how does it survive? It survives with the support of the United States, with the weapons being sent to Haiti by the US. And at any point where Haitians have gathered and you know, in large scale demonstrations and also in major coalitions demanding a transition government, like a popular unity transition government that could lead to free and fair elections. The U.S. has blocked those efforts time and time again. And so the assassination of Jovenel Moise leads to the current dictatorship and also now leads to the threat of even more occupation and more invasion, because the situation in Haiti has gotten out of control. And so they want to bring it back under their control, and they want the current government to be in power and to run new fraudulent elections so that this party and this elite rule can continue. And what they're afraid of is they're afraid of like the resurrection, for example, of the Lavalas movement of President Aristide and other popular um, democratic and progressive movements that could really create a new Haiti. And that's what people in Haiti want. They don't want more troops um, committing atrocities like the UN troops did. The UN troops were there from the time of the coup. And what did they bring? They brought a cholera epidemic when UN soldiers from um, when UN soldiers from Nepal defecated in the main river, um, in the main river, the Arctobanit River of Haiti, and created a cholera epidemic where cholera hadn't existed before. The other thing that the UN did is it sent troops into opposition communities to kill off activist leaders, and there was also massive sexual violence. That's the legacy of occupation in Haiti, along with the occupation of Haiti from 1915 to 1934, along with the two coups against the Aristide government. Haitians don't want that again. Haitians want to be able to determine their own destinies, to choose a government of their own choosing in a democratic process that has nothing to do with an invasion force from Kenya, Benin, and the Caribbean, um, overseen by the overseers of the U.S. imperialists. And with regard to the gangs, uh, uh, the agenda of the gangs, and, and you know, the different, uh, if they're paramilitary, the different mm-hmm. forces behind them are the different countries that have different agendas, so that if the one gang takes over, it's going to continue to be this confusion and fighting and, and uh, in the streets among even the gangs at that point. Uh, that was another I, question, and then I'll have one more, yeah. actually. Go ahead. Okay, I think you're right about that. Like, right now, there's, like, the paramilitaries in Haiti right now, they're all calling themselves revolutionary. They're all, like, brandishing their weapons and saying, we are against the Ariel government, we're going to bring a new society to Haiti. And yet the actions of these paramilitaries, you know, are very different. They, the level of killing, not of, you know, this is not like 
the poor versus the rich, the level of killings in the poorest neighborhoods. That's where those 5,000 people have been killed. And they've been killed by these same by these same gangs that are now proclaiming that they're revolutionary and that they're going to bring a new free and fair society to Haiti. And they're claiming that they've united, but I think that that will fall apart like in, in an instant. And what, what's happened is that the government has empowered these paramilitaries and now they're feeling their own power. And so, and they know that there's impunity like for them, like that they will not get, you know, they will, they will not be attacked by the government. And so they've been able to do their side hustles, kidnapping, kidnappings of poor, middle and rich, right? You can be a market woman in Haiti and be kidnapped by the paramilitaries and your family, like has to scrape any resource they have to get you out. So we don't we don't look at these paramilitary formations as like the beacon of a new hate. We look at them as like a creation of of an imperial state and that they're going to thwart attempts at a democratic change in Haiti. And you had a, third a question. question. Yeah, well, yeah, go ahead, BJ. Yeah, I got a question. Um, um, Mr. Rother, who was this gentleman, this brother that they call Barbecue, is one of the top gang leaders? Because what I understand that he's formed an alliance with all of the gangs under under his umbrella. Can, can you talk yeah. about that? Right. Well, you know, when we did when we did the investigation of the massacre in La Saline, which was in 2018. Barbecue was completely involved in it, and and his and force the G nine was was involved in it as were Haitian police and high level Haitian government officials. Um, so now he's and he's a former police officer, and he's projected himself as a revolutionary, as a socialist. He has photos of Che Guevara you know, et cetera. But in terms of his actions on the ground, the mass movement in Haiti does not believe in him. Like he's committed too many atrocities and his grouping has committed too many atrocities against neighborhoods in Port-au-Prince for people to trust that he will bring progressive change to Haiti. The other example of that is Guy Philippe. Guy Philippe, was a leader of the coup in 2004 in Haiti and was arrested on, he was a drug smuggler and he was arrested on drug smuggling, sent to prison in the U.S. for a few years. And then in, amazingly, in the last number of, in the last few months, the U.S. decided to deport him back to Haiti. And so he enters Haiti as like, a, a, again, a lightning rod for, you know, more paramilitary forces, more young men armed with guns. And he's also proclaimed that he's a revolutionary and that he is going to be a leader of a new Haiti. And, you know, for for those of us that have been in solidarity with the grassroots movement in Haiti and have seen that and have seen the amazing work that they've done in local communities, in building schools, in, you know, creating mobile health clinics, in supporting um, communities after the devastating earthquake in 2010. We look at all of these forces with a great deal of suspicion. Mm. Mm. And we think they're mm -hmm. tied, and we think they're tied to the state. Mm -hmm. So, so then... Uh Lastly, I guess for me, um, what's the solution? It doesn't seem like anybody except the poor people of Haiti have the interest of Haiti at heart. So is there, do you, do you see a way out of this situation, a, situ, uh, a solution to bring in Haiti back to whatever you might call normalcy, uh, self-governing? 
Well, you know, it's interesting because there is a really dynamic grassroots movement in Haiti. And there are, and it's like numbers of, of like popular organizations really based deeply in, in communities, in the poorest communities in Haiti. And, you know, they're the future of Haiti. You know, like, for example, and Lavalas is an example of that. You know, Lavalas means the flash flood. And it was the, it was the movement that brought Aristide to power in, in 1990 and the first democratic election in Haiti. And it still exists in Haiti. And, and it's like the, the theme of Lavalas is, you know, that as the flood trickles down the mountains, it picks up more water more power and eventually it becomes unstoppable and you know we believe in that movement you know not just it's not just about Aristide's party but we we have seen enough from the grassroots in Haiti to believe that the future lies with them and you know one example is on the, at the same time as the airport was being attacked and the prison was being overwhelmed and 4,000 to 5,000 prisoners, you know, escaped. There was a graduation being held um, at a college called Junifa, which was set up by the Aristides when they came back from exile in South Africa. It now has, and, and you know, and, and they almost couldn't hold the graduation because the area around that university is, is, filled with these with paramilitary violence. And so, you know, how are the families going to get through that? How are the students going to come to the campus? And in in fact, thousands of both students, families from the poorest areas of Haiti were determined to get there and they were able to hold the graduation. You know, and so that's an example of the determination and the perseverance of, you know, of, of regular Haitians who are determined. They want school. They, you know, food insecurity. Like, close to half the country is near starvation. Like, food. They want to be able to live in their homes without getting thrown out by violence and being forced to move, right, by the hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands of Haitians have had to, have had to leave the country. And we saw how they were greeted here, right? When they were on that Texas border and being mm. whipped. Remember mm. those images? Haitians being whipped. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, right by the border, by border patrol agents. And these Haitians had come fleeing these same conditions created by the U.S. And yet once they got here, they were turned. It was so racist, and and those images evoked the images of slavery, of course, right? And you know, but this movement in Haiti has survived coups. It survived the killings of you know thousands and thousands of people, the exile of key leaders, and it is still strong. And we would ima- I would imagine that in the next period of time. You're going to see that movement rise up again, you know, and not not with just these not with these paramilitaries, but with the real people from the communities who have never stopped fighting for a new Haiti. Hmm. Robert, we we got a, we got about seven minutes. Talk about the event that's planned for April six. Okay, all right, and it's a it's a a hybrid event. Like we're going to do it. It's like we have a venue in um, East Oakland called the East Side Arts Alliance, where there's going to be like, you know, in-person event. But then it's also going to be on Zoom. And, you know, it's going to it's going to feature two leaders of Fami Lavala, Maurice Narcisse, Dr. Narcisse, who ran for president um, in one of the elections that were, you know, totally you know, where people were not able to vote, the vote was suppressed, like, 
you know, obviously she would have done so much better if it were a free and fair election. She was their presidential candidate. And Pasha Borb, another leader of Fami Lavala, who is now like um, has quadriplegia because of an assassination attempt on his life. So they're going to be mm. speaking as well as a sister a Palestinian, Sister Rama Ali Kassed, who is a co-founder of the U.S. Palestinian Community Network, which I know is very strong in Chicago, and Walter Turner, who does a radio show, Africa Today, on KPFA, and is going to speak about the connection between Haiti and the African continent. And so, mm. and, and also Pierre Lebossier, who is a co-founder of the Haiti Action Committee, is a Haitian national, um, and, you know, grew up under Papa Doc Duvalier and has been like a key leader in Haiti, in Haiti solidarity in the U.S. So what I would like to do is be able to get, once we get the link together, to be able to send it to you so that you could, you know, send it to your um, listeners and, you know, be able to attend that event. Oh, ab- ab- absolutely. And, and we'd like to um, have you back before the event so we can help let, let people know um, what's happening. Um, we've, I think we've had a very good conversation. Is there, are there any points, any items that we didn't cover that you think we need to cover as we wrap this up? Anything you want to add? Anything you want to say? Well, I, I want to thank you for, you know, for having us and for your continued solidarity with Haiti. You know, this isn't the first time <clears throat> that that we've been in connection with you. You know, I think we've mm. had Haiti speakers before and, mm-hmm. you know, and also articles that have appeared, you know, that so, you know, solidarity is, is really important. And, you know, Haiti is not, Haiti has been marginalized as you well know, and it's been, you know, it's been put to the side, it's been demonized, everything, you know, all of the attacks on black people here, like, have been done to Haiti, you know, since its birth. And so it's a very, very important struggle. We are always fighting for its centrality, you know, that you you can't be an anti-imperialist, you can't be an anti-racist, You can't, you know, like you can't be anti-colonialist and not support the Haitian grassroots movement. So thank you, you know, and and of course we would love to be on it. Great. Now, how do we follow you? How do we get in touch with you? How do we support your organization and the work that you're doing? Okay, there's two there's there's two places that you can go. One is like you can look for the Haiti Action. Facebook page. If you go on Facebook and you and you put in Haiti Action Committee Facebook, you'll go to our Facebook page where we put like both news articles and any events that are coming up. Our website is www.haitisolidarity.net. That's www.haitisolidarity.net. And then we fundraise through the, like, for the grassroots movement, and we have no paid staff, so everything goes directly to Haiti. And so if you want to contribute to grassroots efforts in Haiti, it's the Haiti Emergency Relief Fund. And so that's www.haitiemergencyrelief.org. All right. Well, Robert, thank you so much for coming on. Um, like I said, we'll reach out to you. We'll have to have you back. And um, or if anything comes up that you think uh, we need to know about, let us know. And we'll try to get right to it, okay? But thank you very right. much. I think we had a great conversation. Yes, I, I feel that way too. Thank you. And thank you for your questions and your thoughts. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you good Rob. night. All right. Good night. Good night. Man, it's good stuff. Good wow. stuff, brother. Yeah, man. I mean, it's, you know, I've been, and you all know how long I've been trying to get to this Haiti piece, right? Yeah, right, right. But, but, but to, to spend the time and brothers and sisters, we went into the history 
because we we want you to understand the foundation of the violence that you see. So when you hear about gangs in Haiti, don't think gangs. Replace that word in your mind with paramilitaries. Right. These are these are basically private armies. Some are working with the government, the current government that's in power. Some are working with other political parties, right? Some are working yes, with sir. this small group of oligarchs that control Haiti. Um, and, and I think that, you know, I mean, it's a shame what has happened. We cannot, and, again, we cannot just abandon our people. You know, they've done such a masterful job, Brother Nabai, Brother James D., of uh, disconnecting us from Haiti. Because the way, you know, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. And the way you phrase that about, they keep using the word gangs. Mm-hmm. And so when you think about gangs, oh man, you know, you just don't have any mm-hmm. kind of uh, real, real concept of what they're fighting for. And they've already labeled them. So you're going to dismiss them as criminals, you know, mm-hmm. I'm glad mm-hmm. you did that. Yeah. And, and there, there's certainly, there's criminality all woven through it. But these right. are not just people who engage in street crimes. Right. They are now they have now grown to such a point that they may be turning on their former masters, meaning you got a political party, but the political party wants to um, you know, enact violence. They don't do it themselves, they got a little group. Right. right. They got a paramilitary organization. And that right. group goes out, intimidates, assassinates and, and does all these things. But, you know, thank you, brothers. Brother BJ, we got about a minute. You yes, want sir. to get us out of here? Let's get out of here, brothers and sisters. We thank you all so much. Go to our website, straightwords.com, straightwords.com. And uh, right after the show is over there, after shortly, it'll be up on our website. You can uh, go back and listen to all the interviews. And we have some uh, very, very compelling content on tonight. And we want to thank all of our guests. And also, brothers and sisters, if y'all would like to donate to us, we would love for you to participate in uh, helping this show continue on on WVON. 